Everybody Matters podcast, a show dedicated to the idea that when organizations care enough to show their people that who they are and what they do matter, they unlock the only business idea with truly unlimited potential. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. Don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at Barry Waymiller, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. One of the things we like to do from time to time on the Everybody Matters podcast is to hold up a company that's on a similar journey as ours. One of the things we like to do from time to time on the Everybody Matters podcast is to hold up a company that is on a similar journey to ours. The journey to create an environment at work where people go home feeling uplifted and valued. One such company is Cambridge Engineering. Cambridge is a family-owned company in the St. Louis, Missouri area that's been around for more than 50 years. As their website says, Cambridge has been committed to enriching the lives of its people, representatives, customers, and suppliers through the design, manufacture, and application of space heating, ventilation, and cooling products in commercial and industrial facilities. Cambridge CEO John Kramer and President Mark Braun recently appeared at the BW Leadership Institute in a roundtable discussion with BWLI partner Susan Conrad. Susan moderated an engaging conversation about how Cambridge took steps to create a better culture within their company and how they continue to maintain and live their values every single day. And the discussion starts off with Cambridge CEO John Kramer. A little bit about Cambridge. Uh, my father started the, the company 55 years ago, and I'm second generation. And I grew up through the ranks. I, I worked there as a kid, uh, and it was my mother that, that encouraged me to start there uh, right out of college. And uh, eventually, uh, I became the president of the company, and I had 16 direct reports. And everybody looked at me, John, what should I do? What should I do? What's the next thing? Where do we go? What do you do? And I, I don't, what do you do? You know, with family training, all that stuff, I came up with a list of uh, 100, and we came up with 132 different projects or initiatives, you know, priorities for this next year. And by the end of the next year, we, I think it grew to like another 40, 160 projects, because we didn't finish six. But anyway, that was kind of a little bit about my background, what I learned, and it's like, man, I love this company, but I want to do something with it. So I, it's about finding the, you know, the right people to help let us go. And uh, so that's kind of our journey, so we start. Yeah, so then I entered 10 years ago, uh, John sat down with me and said, in that much energy and that much passion, <laughs> with an extremely high vision for what he wanted to go out and build, he sat down with me and said, um, I don't work with, I don't ever hire friends, we were friends, uh, but would you join me and uh, would you help and would you work with me to grow a growth-based business that held on to all the family values? And um, I'll, there, was, there were three things that come to mind of why I joined. So most of my friends said I was really crazy to come in but it was John who uh, was attractive. Um, his vision was extremely high. Um, it was so high that there was, it was very clear his purpose was bigger than what he could accomplish on his own. So an extremely uh, high bar for, for vision. The second thing was just a um, courageous humility. He was asking with humility, will you come help me? And uh, he's been doing that every day for the last 10 years, every day I've worked under him, he's had that humility to say, I know I can't do this on my own. Um, we're gonna need a lot of great people to go out and accomplish this. Um, I had never seen that kind of humility out of a leader, and so that was attractive. Um, the couple other things, um, his heart for, I could just see his heart for m myself and our family. He wanted me to be better off after I was there than before I came. And uh, that has extended through the organization and has built basically a team of, I've, I've never seen the collection and quality of the team that we have at Cambridge, all working to do that same thing, to pour into others. You know, it, it can become trite whenever you say, say it often and you say you want people to be better 
husbands and fathers and sisters and brothers, but it's deep and it's real and it comes directly from his vision. And I think the last one is um, he had a simple faith. Uh, he was willing to share that and to, to express how he relied on something larger than him uh, to do this. And so that, those, those things were very attractive coming in. And so I entered 10 years ago. So and you, you talk about this vision, this compelling vision that's bigger and more ambitious than you thought, mm, this, is, this is something different. Can you tell us a little bit about what is that vision for Cambridge and, and how do you see that playing out inside the organization? Well, Mark's a, a really great guy to do this. It, it, you know, me, uh, I inherited, I had the, the business from my father, second generation. And there's, there's two types of goals. So there's be goals and there's do goals. Well, I never wanted to be, I wanted to do and, and build on something that I've been given. And so I'm always out there. And knowing me, I'm ADD with dyslexia. So I'm the best <laughs> boss to work for because I'm always changing. Actually, no, it's, 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 it's like, what did I say? <laughs> uh, but you know, it, I'm very hard to work for, actually, because I, I never really uh, set goals where people can achieve and accomplish something and feel like at the end of the day, they've done something. Because bad was never bad enough and good was never good enough. And, and I had to learn something about myself. And when you find somebody like Mark, you know, it's like, I'm out here. He's like, what about this? And he goes, shook. It's like, can you go a little slower and make me feel better with you know, what I want? But it's the ability to synthesize and extract you know, tangible, uh, achievable objectives. Or saying, you know, this is where this is going to go. Do you really want to go there? It's like, eh. you know. So it's just learning more about that. And, and that's been a lot of that, that journey. The vision, um, as I've learned, is my passion is to uh, restore glory and dignity to manufacturing. Because I worked out there, I worked in the shop as a kid, and I learned, but it's like, every day you go home, you, you, you go home exhausted, you go home spent. Uh, because you, you want to avoid getting in trouble, you want to avoid not screwing up, getting laughed at, and you always have to go to your boss, what should I do, you get approval, this or that. And you don't have any energy left the day. But really, if you learn how to solve problems and fix what bugs you, give you, you time to focus on that, people are go home learning how to solve problems. They're going to go home being better mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons or daughters. And that's just by little simple things we can do at work. So that's kind of what has become my vision. It used to be world domination and crush things and crush competition. <laughs> and, and people like that per se, but it didn't make them feel tangible. It's, it's really learning to engage people and that's the fun. You can hear the passion come out. Um, you know, I think about, um, I was thinking about when I come in Normally, I just uh, I wanted to share a couple things before we got too far in, and I I've forgotten to share them already. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna do them right now if I can. I think sure. um, you can hear courageous leadership, um, and I think that that's when you build a culture of continuous improvement like Barry Waymiller has. It takes a lot of courage of the leaders of your organizations, and so. Uh, one of the things that I think about whenever I think about courage is you have to be afraid of something to be courageous. You have to actually have fear to step into that fear and do something. And so um, one of the two, two fears that I have coming in today, I'm just going to name them so that maybe you guys could help me overcome them. One fear is that I would say something uh, that would, um, would share in some way that I don't love and respect this man. Um, and it is so deep and so wide, my love and respect for him. He is ADD and D dyslexic, and he's really hard to work for. That is with full re utmost respect for him. <laughs> um, Way to be candid. Yeah. The, the second thing is that we would somehow uh, make you believe that we created this beautiful culture. If you ever get a chance to experience the culture at Cambridge, um, I believe you'll fall in love with the people of Cambridge. And there's 100 families back there that are actually the material and the people that are actually building the culture. And, and so if you were to go back there, you would learn so much more than you would in this hour. Um, we've gotten the pleasure of traveling around the world and seeing some of the greatest companies. I got to see Barry Wimler up in Wisconsin, one of the, one of the coolest experiences. Um, one of the coolest experiences. There are many cool experiences whenever I've gone out. But I've never really learned anything when I've listened to the president or the owner. 
I've only learned whenever I've sat and talked with the people on the front line that are actually doing the work and they can describe how they're building the culture. And if they own it, then it's real. And if they don't, it's all just an imaginary um, flyer. And so I can tell you, for the, who, who is here at Barry Miller from Barry Miller? Uh, the purpose that you're building is real, and the people that I got to talk with in Wisconsin really owned it. And so that's what you're after, that's what we're after, and, and I hope that you'll come back um, to Cambridge and experience that. So my second fear is that I will say something that will make you think that we created it, we didn't do it. Um, but there are 100 people back there that can share with you how they created and built it, and they own it. So those are the two fears that you guys can help me with. Awesome. I don't remember the question. I, that's okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Good. This is a partnership. Good. We talked about the, the vision for yeah. Cambridge, right? To restore yeah. the glory and dignity to manufacturing. How does that look inside Cambridge? So you've got a big vision, you've got um, very ambitious goals, and then take that into ma designing and manufacturing ventilation <laughs> equipment, right. creating patents for new technologies. How does that look on a daily basis? So let me now answer the first question that you asked. What is the vision of Cambridge? And he shared from his perspective, um, I was attracted to this vision that he had, but it wasn't written down and it was really messy when it was articulated. And so we spent literally the first six years um, trying to figure out how to write it down and capture it. And he's mentioned a few of them, dominate the world, destroy the competition, build a $100 million company. There were all these words that came out. 400 million. And nobody, they didn't resonate. I, I, every, the coolest part about vision is when you write it down and it's real, it actually attracts the people you want to attract. And so he would write it down. I'm like, that's not why I'm here. That's not it. And so I would say, go back to the drawing board. And he would go back and he would try to write it down again. And he would come back and it was like, no, that's not it. And so what, what was real was um, that there was this beautiful uniqueness to it and we started attracting people by telling them the story of what he had told me and people around the room we've got if you could raise your hand if you're from Cambridge um, those people and many many back at Cambridge um, were attracted by the same vision so we ended up writing it down and we we wrote it down and uh, it scared us um, the actual vision that we wrote down was Cambridge exists to glorify God by enriching the quality of every life we touch and when we wrote it down, I can feel um, there, there was a team around the room, and we were like, uh, can we do that? We don't, I don't think we can do that. That's not OK. And, uh, we, we, but it resonated with us. And, it's, and we all pointed and said, that's actually why I'm here. That's why I'm here. It resonated. And uh, so we took it out to the, this is then how does that look? We took it out to the 100 employees and sat down with groups of 5 to 10 and sat down and put it up in front of the screen. And they're like, yeah, that's, that's why I'm here. And that takes some real balls to put that up in the screen. They said, that's courageous. That's scary. They said, what does that mean? Are you going to not hire people that don't believe in God? No, no, no. We'll hire anybody. Yeah. All we wanted is a passion to serve and a, a love of people and listening ears. But we got to write that down. And so that's, that's the vision statement that we wrote down four years ago. And that's the one that will never be accomplished. And that's the one that I feel like I could work on for the rest of my life and just get closer and closer, but never achieve. That's the one that's really powerful. It's amazing um, when you're able to put it into words, right? how that generates a whole different set of conversations and opens up all kinds of different relationships. Um, one of the terms that I've heard you all use is um, the way you work towards your vision is through unconditional love and high expectations. And so that idea, right, sometimes could be viewed in tension, no, right. Major tension. And so, how how does that look um, when you, if I'm sitting at Cambridge? What does that mean for unconditional love and high expectations? You know, that was um, that was a fun one. I blame Kevin Thompson on that one. No, uh, he's our CFO and in the operations uh, CEO at the time. But you know, really, people loving people is the first thing. And, and what does it look like? And and then he brought in a book that he had picked up on vacation on, called Love Works and, and talked about using unconditional love. And like, you know, that's so cool. But a lot of people, you know, what does that mean? And unconditional love is what you use for your teenage son or your daughter, you know, so, you know that we all have to have for our kids. But um, it's really the, 
loving people and working with them together, but we do have high expectations um, in, in building that together. So that was a, a journey of, of being able to understand what that is and, and how it works and being able to say, hey, we love you, but that doesn't mean you're a right fit for the organization. Um, how can we help you grow? How can we help you thrive? Uh, what's, what's disconnecting? Um, Am I being approachable as, as a boss or supervisor? Uh, and, and so it unwrapped a lot of that stuff, and it was really unwaiting to be able to say that. But it's certainly a funny time to be bringing up the word love and part of your uh, mission, why in you a, exist. In a huge manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. Probably not been said a lot. Not a lot of times, no. But it's said often in our conversations on discipline and on when a person is struggling. Um, and so. I don't know if, if you guys know, but my life sometimes has real major struggles, and uh, everyone that works for us um, has major struggles in their life, somewhere or somehow. And so when they're facing that struggle, whether it be an, an aging parent or uh, an addiction to some substance or whatever it is, the conversation goes like this. So what are they struggling with? How are we being loving to them right now? And also, how can we help clarify what's what are the expectations? Because um, I think the two things that children ask um, is, am I loved and can, can I get my own way? And I think that's the same thing that our employees ask is, am I loved, do you love me for who I am, not for what I do for you, and can I get my own way? Which means, can I do whatever the heck I want to around here and it's fine? And, and the answer is, yes, you're loved and no, you can't get your own way. We're actually doing something together collectively that's bigger than you and it's bigger than me. I can't get my own way, you can't get your own way, but you are loved. And so those, that tension, there's conflict there. And we're not done at all. We wrote that uh, phrase down, we behave with unconditional love and set high expectations by demonstrating care, courage, integrity, and respect. Wrote that down courageously four years ago and uh, we're still defining it. We're still trying to break down, you guys have uh, you are an inspiration to us on how you've written down some of your leadership principles. We're working on that right now. How do you break unconditional love into some components that actually look like listening and genuine interest in others? And how do you, how do you build um, an eager one in other people? That is loving to do that. And so we're, we're working on that every day. You know, I, I mentioned um, at the beginning, I, I have the good fortune to see this firsthand. My brother, um, who I've known, you know, all my life. <laughs> he's younger than me. Um, and so, and he'd tell you he's better looking, but he's not here, so he can't defend us. Anyway, um, Doug is um, a very passionate, driven, um, high energy professional. Um, father of four kids and, um, and good husband. Um, and what I've seen in his four and a half years at Cambridge is a complete transformation of him as a professional, him as a dad, him as a spouse. Um, what he's done with his life to me um, and watching his growth, see, he's so much more grounded and so much um, more fulfilled in his work. And I, and I keep saying, what happened? What happened? So that's what led me really back to Cambridge to say, what is going on here to see this you know, grown man who's you know, successful and really moved to this life of significance. And so um, I credit the Cambridge team and, and everybody, right? It's, you guys are great, but you're right, it is, it's the whole organization. And I think about that, and, and you're, you know, your group is a lot of really bright, you know, you've got engineers and you've got frontline you know, machinists who are coming right out of high school or trade school. How do you balance that in such a diverse environment? How do you, how do you create that? unconditional love, that high expectation, and kind of that, that you know, path forward for anybody mm -hmm. in the organization. So, so it's interesting, Susan, when you talk about that, it is for me, um, and, and you, uh, you really help me dig a little bit deeper in this, but as a leader, you know, what are you gonna change about yourself to get the results you're looking for? You know, as be at home raising kids or whatever, I'm not getting results. So either I have to pound my fists harder or, and shout louder and expect different results, or I have to say it's not coming across right. What do I need to change about myself? And so, you know, <clears throat> first of all, I've had to learn a lot about myself, and it is it's painful, but it's so rewarding. 
it's unwaiting. You know, learning what I need to change to get the results that I'm looking for, to get in rhythm and pace. That's not my natural style. Uh, and, and so that's what I've learned in being able to love and celebrate other people is knowing that I need that all myself and how much they need it. Now, sometimes it's a little painful because Mark can go there real quick with me. Um, that's his God-given talents and abilities, but, but connecting that and celebrating the, the goodness of that. It's just painful sometimes. Um, but I, I love that. So it's learning that as part of that, I think, is instilled. And I see that in all the, the leaders here that we're all wanting to learn, wanting to grow. And, and it's like, you know, that didn't come across right. Did, how did you say? And I could even ask, work with my admin assistant. It's like, I just talked with a, an employee. Did, did that sound right? Did I use the right words? And it's like, well, you could have used, spun this a little bit better. It was like, oh, okay. You know, but we're all in it together because we're all trying to figure out how to build and grow and thrive together. And it's awesome. The, uh, <coughs> See your, that's well, I'm just wondering, you know, so you asked the question, I believe, that um, you know, how do you get it all the way up and down through the whole organization, right? And so, um, I mean, I've, I've got, had the pleasure of working with high-functioning teams throughout the last 20 years, but I've always had small teams that I have really close contact with, and so you can do it just in the daily conversations, in the personal check-ins, in the discussions one-on-one where you're celebrating and encouraging and appreciating. I think one of the secrets that has been helpful um, as we've built out the culture, I've never seen anywhere, I've never been involved with anywhere that it's actually all the way through the organization where engagement levels are all the way through the organization. So I've never seen that anywhere. I, I, I saw it really close up in Wisconsin, but I've never seen it. I've seen it in Zingerman's up in uh, Ann Arbor, but not very many places have I seen engagement all the way across. And that is our goal. That's what we're wanting. We're wanting growth of every employee, not just uh, Doug, right? We're wanting growth uh, and engagement by every employee. And so what's, what we had to do is to make it simpler than, than what we talk about. And so it's had to become daily habits, ritualistic daily habits that allow that culture to be built out. And that allows that to happen all the time and be accessible across the whole organization. So I, I know we've talked about daily habits, but that's really, that's really the answer. I don't know if you want to hear about yeah. some of those. You guys want to hear about some daily habits? Yeah. yeah. So when you think about daily habits, we've got uh, three that I'll, I'll just mention. There are more than this, but these are the three probably core ones. One is a daily habit of a morning meeting. And uh, morning meeting, we have a 15-minute daily huddle that basically has everybody, all the companies involved with. It's high energy. It's volunteer-based leadership. So 70 out of the 100 people have volunteered. And they come in and they lead the whole company in a daily meeting. And so they've got a microphone. So they're, they're basically in this position right here. And 70 out of the 100 people have volunteered to do this. And they lead the whole company through a daily huddle. And they share their heart. They've got five minutes of the time when they can share anything about their life. They can share any life experience or any lesson that they've learned or pictures of their family or whatever it is. And so we get to know a little bit about them. And then we pass around the mic for gratitude, and that's become a daily habit of gratitude across the whole organization. So I'll tell you, I know your, your, um, your brother well because I am a lot like him, and my head thinks, like, I wanna, I've got the right answer. I've got this thing. And with gratitude, it breaks that cycle of thinking that I have to be right all the time. And so if we start the day with gratitude for others, that's become a daily habit that the whole organization from top to bottom gets to experience and participate in. If that one little tiny cultural change happened across all of our companies, if we could just start the days with gratitude instead of starting the days with, with, a, with a, oh my goodness, look at my horrible day, um, it would change the world. That one little habit. Got to tell you a story from home. So this morning, get up, and we've got an exchange student from Spain who's going to his first day of school today. So you can imagine the energy in the home is pretty high, and I'm getting ready for this. And, the, and so I get out our gratitude jar from below the cabinet, and I put it on the top of the counter. And I just start writing what I'm thankful for and putting it in. And so my kids know this habit, and so they start writing that. How do you ritualize a daily habit of gratitude our organization did it, and so then I was able to do it home, and it built, it just builds into the fabric of everything. So that's a daily habit of gratitude. And then another daily habit that we have 
is um, we dedicate time. Um, so if you read uh, beautiful books like Good to Great or any of the good books, the amount of leaders that talk about a daily habit of, of study and of time on themselves where they're thinking about working on the business instead of in the business or working on themselves instead of just going in the daily grind. Um, everyone knows the value in it, but we don't build it into the habits of our businesses. So at Cambridge, we have. We've got a 30-minute daily time that every single employee is encouraged to improve their job instead of do their job. And they're told from day one, this time from 8.45 to 9.15 is the time when you're supposed to improve your job, not do your job. And that's another daily habit to build the culture. There's a lot there. But those are some of the daily habits, examples of how you work to build a culture where everybody's engaged. Right, and everybody has the opportunity to participate wherever, whenever. Wherever, whenever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I like also the personal professional check-in. It, it, it's That's the weekly habit, but the, the, uh, the enterprise team gets together every week and we go around pretty much like two minutes. What's going on in your personal life? What's going on in your professional life? Because you're working shoulder to shoulder with people, but we never really know what's going on in the rest of your life, and so it's it's not it's a no comment zone. We just say thank you for sharing, but we all have life outside of business. You, you know, uh, parents, aging parents, kids, friends, sickness, cancer, death, uh, celebrations, joys, victories. You know, little league games, all sorts of stuff that's going on that we have no idea because we're supposed to go to work every day and think work, 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 and yet. Hearing those things, it's just so, so rich and so rewarding. You know what's going on in the background. And sometimes people can pick up the slack when they need it. Other times you get to celebrate it. But that is also a, that's a weekly habit, but it is a, it is a habit that's habit. rich. Thanks for listening to the Everybody Matters podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the BW Leadership Institute and see a list and sign up for one of their upcoming classes, go to bwli.com. That's bwli.com. You can also find them on Twitter at BW Lead Institute. If you'd like to find out more about Bob Chapman and Ross Zodia's book, Everybody Matters, The Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family, go to everybodymattersbook.com. For updates on the book, this podcast, and to get a lot of great content and insight, don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at barrywaymiller, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, Everybody Matters is the only business idea with truly unlimited potential.